Welcome wrestling fans, welcome to Curtain Jerk, and as always I'm your host Jacob Grandi reporting for the Main Event Marks YouTube channel and the Dragon Suplex Podcasting Network. I literally think that I'm the only one still on that network, but it's a good network to be on because it gets me to you guys. Without them, I would not be talking to you right now. You would not be a listener of the show unless you're listening on YouTube, Main Event Marks. Those guys are good guys too. Those guys are the best guys. I love uh, you know interacting with them on Twitter, on YouTube, on any Instagram. Any time I interact with them, I'm always having a good time, and I'm always having a good time with you guys. I'm always having a good time talking about wrestling. We're going to talk about Noah. We're going to be talking about WWE. We're going to be talking about AEW. We're going to be talking about. Sammy and Ty being stripped of the mixed tag titles after no showing a triple A event. Uh, Mox having issues dropping the GCW title to Gage earlier this year. And now it looks like Sammy and Ty are having troubles. You know, um, I, I Conan says that it was an issue with Ty Mello's uh, um, visa. Uh, it says it's hard to get a visa nowadays. Um, I don't know. They were also booked on AEW. So, yes, it was on TV, but Sammy only had a promo. So they could have definitely shot that promo um, last week or something like that. And then Ty had a, you know, a solid little tag match. But, I mean, I don't know. As a fan, I think I would have enjoyed the match better in Mexico had I seen it. But I probably wouldn't have seen it. So maybe for them on a, a career level did the right thing but you know now they're not going to have anywhere to fall back on if they screw over Mexico too bad Conan on his podcast made it seem like it wasn't too big of a deal so maybe they didn't really burn a bridge over there but either way the title is stripped from them who will it go to next have they've already been crowned we most of us don't know in the states most of us don't know but someone who did lose the title that we do know about in the States, FTR. I said it, 2023 is not going to be good to them. 2023 is going to be the yin to their 2022's yang. I feel like they went up and now they're coming down. And it's a good time for them to come down. Um, you know, they lost the guns on on uh, AW. They already lost the Ring of Honor titles. They already lost the AAA titles. So they're going into Wrestle Kingdom against two... You know, staples of New Japan, two guys that they know aren't going to wrestle anywhere else but at New Japan affiliated shows in Tenzan and Yoshihashi. So I think that the critique of FTR is that, you know, they're not, they're, they have the IWGP championships, but they're not defending them on New Japan shows where Yoshihashi and, Ten, and I'm saying Tenzan, Goto, excuse me, uh, are definitely going to be on New Japan show, so I think they're going to drop it there, and the trend is going to continue. Uh, from what Dax says, is their contract with AEW is up uh, in April, April around the time Mania is. I can see them going back to WWE. I don't know. Uh, we'll see where 2023 takes the revival. We'll see where 2023 takes Sammy and Ty. Um, 2022, however, the last day or the last. SmackDown last Friday of 2022 took us to SmackDown, like we just said, and Rampage. We'll talk about Rampage a little later. But as you guys know, I usually don't watch WRB week to week. But I mean, our boy Cena came back, so you know I'm tuning in. Cena used to not be well liked by fans, not to be well liked by you know fans like me. By me, you know, I was kind of tired of seeing him after a while. But then you start to realize. Uh, Cena was good. Cena reminds you of a simpler time. Makes you want to call your mom. Makes you want to bust out that old band shirt you have in high school and see if it still fits. Makes you want to click back through old Facebook photos from 2007. Cena is just a part of Americana at this point. He's kind of like... He's kind of like John Cena. He's the fucking man. You guys know what I'm talking about. If I was a good podcaster, I would have Cena music under that little rant, but I'm not. Cena is a better wrestler than I'm a podcaster. I'll say that right now. So I tuned into SmackDown to see it. 
But of course, it wasn't all just Cena. Bray Wyatt promo, LA Knight comes out, and it's official. I assume they're wrestling each other at the Rumble. Uncle Howdy comes out and attacks Bray, not attacking LA Knight. LA Knight did a great job at acting confused. I thought that was kind of relatable because I was confused. I mean, what the hell's going on with that? Uh... I lost what this all means like a long time ago, maybe after the second QR code that I was supposed to click through the internet to figure out what it meant, but I think that this match will be good. It'd be a good test for Bray, even though Bray's the bigger star here, because LA Knight is, you know, a good hand. He's a good story-driven wrestler. He can tell a good story in the ring. He can talk people into the seats, where Bray Wyatt is hit or miss throughout the years. Bray was doing numbers when he came back but since then his numbers have dropped not his merch sale numbers but his ratings so i think to justify this push that he's still getting he's gonna have to do a great match here and i think he's got a great uh you know opponent to have that great match with in la night another thing that happened uh ronda versus raquel who's the ring general there no one knows did we have one i don't know this match was okay leaning on not good but okay until the end, armbar armbar locked in on the top rope from Ronda, spilling all the way to the mat, taking Raquel down. Raquel tapping out to Ronda. Ronda wins, and then Charlotte's music hits. She returns from the I Quit match at Mania, and they do the Yokozuna Hulk Hogan spot from WrestleMania 9. Now I am not saying Raquel is Bret Hart by any means, but this was uh, kind of an okay thing to do, kind of hot-shotting uh, this program, uh, kind of shake things up in the women's division on SmackDown. It has, you know, you tune in for Cena, and you get a noteworthy thing like this happening. I think it was a nice little icing on the cake um, if you're going to do something like this. Ronda's contract is up around WrestleMania, around April, so this kind of hot-shot booking makes me think that, uh, you know, Ronda might not re-sign. But, like, just fantasy booking here, I mean, they could have the rematch from the I Quit match at Rumble. They could have the rematch from the I Quit match at Mania if they want to have, like, a little uh, schmaz, as they say, in the Women's Rumble this year. I don't know, but I kind of fuck with it. I want to see what happens here. The bloodline, always good. Sammy teasing, a little tension is always good. You know, asking, do you get mad when the crowd chants, Sammy, 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 when you're out there? Big pause. Roman just says, no. The tension is there. You got to love it. A little more fantasy book in here. If they're trying to take the titles from Roman, have Sammy win the first night of Mania in his Brian Mania 30 moment, but The Rock helps him get to that moment, and then the second night you have The Rock versus Roman. So then, you know, when you're selling pay-per-view, selling Peacock subscriptions, you have on SportsCenter the next day, you have on uh, E.T., you know, The Rock and Roman, you know, doing all that Sunday morning and then say Sunday night by WrestleMania, The Rock and Roman Reigns are going to wrestle each other. I think that would sell tickets. I think that would sell subscriptions. Whatever you need to sell, I think it would make money. Then we get the Cena match. Sammy and Roman versus Kevin Owens and John Cena. Kevin Owens busted up early and KO gets his receipt from popping Roman Reigns in the ear at War Games. Cena with the hot tag KO and Cena do the 10-knuckle shuffle. You got to love that shit. Cena and Kevin Owens get the victory. Fun little match there. I felt like I didn't waste my time watching SmackDown, which is more than what I could say about watching Monday Night Raw past few months, past few years, honestly. I kind of am getting that way to AW Dynamite, but I still watch it every single week and review for you guys. Rest in peace, Don West. You got to love the graphic here. Much like John Cena... Don West wasn't liked early on uh, by like you know members of the internet wrestling community but then he was just so good at what he does that you had to give him more and more respect as the years go on and in retrospect almost more so uh, does he get respect in hindsight because uh, I'm jumbling up my words here but he gets more respect in hindsight because people go back and watch these classic clips go back and watch these classic matches from TNA 2000s and see how good he was at selling the match i mean that's what he did he was kind of you know bringing billy may's energy into pro wrestling landscape in the early 2000s 
And I don't think we were ready in the early 2000s. It wasn't until the 2010s where we kind of dubbed him a legend. And then here he is in 2022 passing away. Sad to hear. Truly sad, sad to see. Uh, Sting and Darby kind of getting in each other's faces here in kind of like a brotherly respect kind of way in lieu of Darby's next match against Samoa Joe in Darby's hometown for the TNT title. Mox promo. I like Moxley, but people are saying that he's the 2022 wrestler of the year. And I was like, it's okay. You know, people have crack addictions. People have crack habits. Don't judge them. But then I found out these people actually aren't smoking crack. They are just completely wrong and do not watch Will Ospreay matches. Um, But even at that, I would give it to Roman Reigns or even MJF before that. I don't think Mox is on my podium, but people are crowning him the champ. Let me know below what you guys think is your wrestler of the year. Because right now, it's Will Ospreay. And then, I mean, even though there's only been nine matches from him... Uh, From what I learned on post wrestling, you got to go MJF from his feud with CM Punk and then holding the world title. Uh, I mean, just recently his match with Ricky Starks, he's done no wrong. You got to put him up there and then you got to put Roman up there. And then, um, I mean, shit, Okada had a great year. Yeah, I don't, Mox ain't making my podium. I'll just say it like that. I mean, Jericho quietly had a great year with his matches with Danielson. And, you know, just everything he does just seems to be some of the best shit on the show every time. So, yeah, I don't know. People are, people are putting Mox on there. If you want to crown him, crown his ass. But I'm not doing that. Sanjay, Lethal, Jarrett, Singh, they have a, you know, a promo in the back. I like this faction. These guys are all, you know, all good talkers except for Singh. All good wrestlers with, for what they do. They know their limitations and they play to the story of the match except for Singh. But Singh obviously can help them tell that story based on his size. And then Jared popped me when he said, you're going to regret that rap. What an, like an old man classic thing to say to, you know, in, re- in rebuttal to someone laying down a diss track on you. But it wasn't just backstage stuff on Rampage. They had four big matches, and we're going to be ranking them from worst to first. Number four, the Kip Sabian match that we missed the start of. Uh, I know they're trying to do something a little different with Rampage, kind of keep people interested with this like crash TV scenario where we miss the start, or maybe they just missed time to start. I don't know. But, uh, you know, if you want to get me upset, if you want to get me talking like an old guy like Jeff Jarrett, if you want to get... Me saying stuff like, get off my lawn, you're going to skip the initial bell sound of a wrestling match. And then I'm going to get pissed. I'm going to say, get the fuck off my gosh darn lawn. Number three, Jade and Kira Hogan. The rare Jade match that isn't last on the rankings on this podcast because of her dominance. Red Velvet stopping Jade from whooping uh, (laughs) Kira Hogan's ass. What the fuck is going on there? I want to see more of that. I'm interested in the Jade story getting a little more interesting because right now all we know is she's a badass. We need to see something we can sink our teeth into. Kind of like how we knew Wardlow was a badass and then we got the MJF story. They haven't really known where to go since then, but it was a good trajectory there where we knew he was badass and then he beat MJF where we know Jade's a badass. Is she going to lose her baddies? Is she going to have to get new baddies? What's going to happen to the baddies who've left? Are they going to attack her and try to get the TBS championship? I'm interested. You got me hooked. Swerve and Yuta, solid match, but I want to see a little more from the two big guys who was introduced last week or two weeks ago on Dynamite. But number one on Rampage, the best match, Orange versus Trent. This match was fun. As Rampage ratings tank, and Cassidy is on every week. I'm becoming a bigger and bigger fan of Orange Cassidy. It was cool to see this match between him and his best friend, so to speak. Kip kind of playing a little mind game, sending Penelope Ford out there, which causes um, Trent to get distracted and rolled up. Uh, they're kind of doing this thing here in AEW now, in the uh, AEW mid-card, where uh, the heels cause tension in the face faction. Um, you know, they got the House of Black with Eddie Kingston and Ortiz, and now they have uh, Kip Sabian with Penelope Ford and doing this to the best friends. Um, I mean, you can kind of see maybe this stuff was written back to back or something, but I don't mind it. There, this seems to be a trope, uh, 
a trope trend in AEW booking as of late. But going over to Noah, reviewing Noah, I think it's called A New Year, New Year. This is a big show they do January 1st. I did not watch the first hour of the show. Big show, multi-man matches for the first hour of big Japanese wrestling shows are so fucking lame. They're so skippable. So I did it. So my first match, Jack Morris versus Timothy Thatcher. Jack Morris uh, didn't know much about him, but he's a six-year vet from the British Wrestling Indies. Uh, this is a big match for him. This was a sick match. Sit down, powerbomb, one, two, three. Morris beats Thatcher, which now any time an XWB guy does not get pushed in another promotion, I worry that they're going back to the WWE. I mean... Hunter is kind of re-signing all these guys that got let go during the pandemic, which is, you know, good. But I love Timothy Thatcher and Noah. It just fits in with his style. The snug, slower pace, great match vibe from Noah that I, I just want to see Timothy Thatcher thrive here. Noah matches are slower, but they are, you know, they're just snug like Thatcher, man. And they do pick up nicely. I love them. I love them a lot. Not like a slow pace like the NWA or anything like that. They 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 kind of draw me in better than that. After the match, Jake Lee, hottest free agent in Japanese wrestling, fresh off leaving all Japan Pro Wrestling, shows up and walks down to the ring and then leaves with Morris. I don't know if this is a team or they're agreeing to a respectful match. I don't know. Uh, I'm going to be butchering these names. Amos, um, Amakasua versus uh, Mia Ki- Miyawaki, uh, GHC junior title on the line. Miyawaki uh, came from Noah, fresh off excursion in Mexico in 2022. Uh, Amosuka, 18-year veteran in Japan, motherfucker can dive his ass off. He was going crazy, cross body off the top, one, two, no. Wild arm drag from Mia Kiwa, uh, where he just runs, jumps over the top rope, and grabs him as he's fallen off. From the f- over the top rope, grabs him on the apron, dumps him to the floor, uh, and then at one point, um, Amasuka catches him in a head scissors off the top rope, and then they kind of keep rolling into a pin. One, two, three. Champ retains. Uh, Segura and Kojima, the the tag champs versus Marafuji and Kenta. Some names that I can say. Some names I'm familiar with. Japanese legends in a tag match. Crowd loves Kenta. Kenta coming home. Uh, classic running dropkick to the face. Seemed like Kenta was working a little more snug in Noah. Maybe, you know, he just feels the crowd, you know, knows that these guys respect him so much, so he's got to deliver the goods. Bitch slap battle with Segura. Kojima dropping a sloppy elbow. Marafuji going off. Lariat from Kojima. One, two, three. Champs retain. Going in to the junior tag title match, uh, KZ and Yohei versus Ogawa and Ida. Uh, KZ, 12-year veteran, mostly in Dragon Gate, raps to the ring, does break dances during the matches. So I'm kind of sold. I mean, anyone who's been a rapper in wrestling, I like. I mean, you go back to Mabel, PM News, uh, Ron Killings, John Cena, Max Caster. I mean, I just like you walk into the ring as you're do- cutting a promo, like Road Dog and Enzo or something like that. I'm sold on this guy. Yo, hey, 13-year-old, 13-year uh, veteran started in Dragon Gate as well. They're the junior ch- tag champs. Ogawa, however, one of the challengers, started in 1985. Noah original jumped from All Japan to Noah with Masawa. Ida also started in Dragon Gate about 11 years ago. Big car driving by. Uh, I like KZ though. He yells, you know, it's KZ time. And misses a 450. I cracked up during that. Snug as fuck. Super kick from Ida to Yohei. One, two, three. We have new champions. Agawa and Ida with the junior GHC champ titles. And then we go in to the world title match. This was the only title that changed hands here, this junior title match. This was a big show. I was expecting a little more uh, stuff. Um, but I guess you had the you had the big uh, debut of Jake Lee, and then you had this title change, and you also had you know a legendary moment to kick off 2023. Kiyomiya and Kino in the world title match. Kimi is the champ, but it seems like he still has something to prove to a lot of hardcore Noah fans and Noah veteran wrestlers. 
Keno is a staple that has the respect from the fans and from the veterans, it seems, and leads a big faction in Congo. So I was interested in this match. Keno stomps off the top. Kiyomiya dives over the top turnbuckle to the floor. Strike battle both down. Blue Thunderbomb off the top rope where Kiyomiya gets slammed onto the apron, the hardest part of the ring. They both fall to the floor. This spot was fucking crazy. Double stomp again. One, two, Kiyomiya kicks out. And then Kiyomiya just builds momentum here. One, two, Keno kicks out and locks in a choke. Champ gets to the rope. Shining Wizard, one, two, Keno kicks out again. Poison Rana, one, two, Keno says no. Shining Wizard again from Kiyomiya, one, two, three. Champ retains, but him taking big bumps like that blue thunder bomb and him just fighting back, fighting back as Keno really was showing fighting spirit there. I think it's going to have that Tommy Dreamer effect in ECW where Noah Faithful and veterans are going to be like, he is hardcore. He is one of us. I mean, he's younger. He's a pretty boy. It's going to be hard to win over, uh, you know, old school fans of Noah and stuff like this, but I think he can do it. I mean, I'm a new fan of Noah. I've really only started watching, you know, 2020, I got brought in with Muda holding the title. 2021 kind of kept me around a little bit. But Kiyomiya is worth tuning in for. Kino is worth tuning in for. And seeing some of these old school guys that are in New Japan that also wrestle over in uh, Noah is cool to see as well. Uh, this world title match was the Steamboat versus Savage match on this big show, which is rare but kind of cool. But who's kidding who? We all tuned in. To the show to see Nakamura versus the Great Muda. Nakamura back in Japan in a big Japanese fight. Feel fucking excited for this one. Nakamura comes out with a mania level entrance. The violin player. This It starts out with this guy playing this large Japanese drum. Like that big, like kind of like this video game. I, I only know these drums from this video game that's popular over there. Um... You know, but just think of a giant drum and someone playing it. And then the violinist over top of that, he comes out in this like white, quasi futuristic, kind of maybe religious looking cloak, comes to the ring, acts like Nakamura. I'm into it. Muda coming out was cool too, but they should have kind of reversed these entrances too. Uh, Muda in control in the early going, brawling on the outside, STF locked in, Nakamura hits the good vibrations, but it's the WWE version of the good vibrations. Unlike Kenta, he's not working more snug for this Noah audience. I think that was a mistake. Um, I remember in New Japan when he would do these good vibrations, they were fucking hard kicks, but then he kind of... When he went to NXT, he did these, like, you know, changed the name to Good Vibrations, you know, a Beach Boys reference in a pro wrestling match. I know he's a surfer, but come on, man. And he kept it going in Noah here. I can't believe it. Uh, Muda going after the leg. Nakamura blocking the Shining Wizard at one point. Poison Mist to the face of Nakamura. Muda using a chair. Ref down. Chair shots all over. Uh, running Lariat down the ramp to Muda, like Muda did to Hulk Hogan in the now famous GIF. More missed in the face of Nakamura. Shining Wizard, Kinshasa, not the Bumaye, but the Kinshasa, uh, both men down. Nakamura, the full on, like just French, kisses Muda to suck the poison mist from Muda's mouth to then spit it back into Muda's face. So Muda lost to the 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 mist the poison mist that he's known for spitting in the face of his opponents since the fucking 80s kinshasa one two three nakamura wins music hits muda walks up the ramp nakamura grabs the mic says bye bye my idol i'm not crying bro you're crying this match was so sick Will this match hold up to be as good as some of the matches that we're going to see on Wrestle Kingdom or maybe the Royal Rumble or even Ricky Starks and Chris Jericho from Dynamite? I'm not sure, but does it kick off 2023 with a bang? And will I remember that this was the first show I saw in 2023? Yes, yeah, so it's good to deliver this. This makes me more excited for Wrestle Kingdom than I was before because I'm just I want that big fight feel. They did say that this is 
Muda's last singles match. So we're not going to get that Sting match. We might get like some kind of six-man tag or trios match with uh, Sting uh, going up against uh, Muda. We're going to get Muda's last match in New Japan on January 4th, teaming up with Tanahashi and uh, Shota Umino. But man, this match, this this show, these last two matches really just reinvigorated my love for pro wrestling. I love podcasting. I love pro wrestling. I'm trying to get my health back in shape. Of course, you know, I'm a runner, but I'm trying to do a little more lifting. I'm trying to watch my diet in 2023. I'm sure you guys hear this all the time. I'm sure, you know, it's kind of... Uh, you know, a joke at times to you guys, but that's what I'm doing. Uh, Let me know if you have any tips on that. Let me know what you're doing in 2023. Let me know if you're listening at all. Fly high. I'm out.